Well, good morning, everyone. There was a particular moment when I was in university that I discovered that studying Hebrew was the thing for me. I was in Dr. Dempster's first year Hebrew class and I'd been trying to translate the sentence that he'd been given me. And I was feeling really embarrassed because there was just no way that it could mean what I thought it meant. But after a little while, I gave my answer anyway. And I said, God has a long nose. And shockingly, I wasn't exactly wrong. Long-nosed or having a long nose is the literal meaning of the Hebrew phrase, which is often translated slow to anger or long-suffering. Our God has a big, long nose. And of course, the biblical authors don't mean this literally. They mean it metaphorically, but it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out what they're getting at. Imagine that you are so angry that your heart starts to beat faster and your hands shake and your whole face turns red. If you have a long nose, that just takes a while. Or picture the imagery in Psalm 18 or 2 Samuel 22, where there's this fierce image of God rising to David's defense in anger and there is smoke billowing out of his nostrils. But his nose is long. This process takes a while. He is slow to anger. I, on the other hand, have a pretty short nose. It's long enough to support the weight of my enormous glasses, but still small enough that I need to figure out what to do with my anger. Anger for me is the most uncomfortable emotion. You know, my clothes are yellow and they're polka dotted. I frequently apologize to inanimate objects when I bump into them. I have the energy at all times of a person who is hosting a craft show for children. And anger, I mean, it's impolite, it's harsh, it causes offense. It feels so incompatible with what we've been taught is acceptable, with what we understand of as holy, with loving one another genuinely, but we still have it. And while on occasion I've been known to have smoke come pouring out of my relatively short nostrils over things that really have no eternal value, sometimes our anger really is justified. What do we do with it then? What does it look like to be faithful and angry? We're going to get a little bit uncomfortable today and deal with a very angry psalm, Psalm 109. And it opens with language that we are comfortable with. Verse 1 reads, My God whom I praise, do not remain silent. The psalmist has encountered some kind of difficulty, and so he looks to God, the only source of help, the only one who is praiseworthy. And he looks to him to act. And we pray like this all the time. It's very familiar to us. But this isn't quite an ordinary, everyday prayer. This is the prayer of someone who is furious, overwhelmingly angry, absolutely seething with rage and indignation, and not without cause. Look at verses 2 to 5. For people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me. But I am a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Good should evoke a response of good. Love should receive a response of love, but the psalmist has extended friendship and been met with with hatred in return. They've extended good and been met with evil. They've been attacked without cause, slandered, and surrounded. We're not told specifically what the situation is that the psalmist is dealing with, but we know that they've been a victim of serious, world-shattering, life-altering injustice. And so the psalmist asks to have his case tried. He has a grievance, and so he brings it to the court of appeal. But an ordinary trial isn't going to cut it for the psalmist today. Look at verses 6 and 7. Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let the accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. May his prayers condemn him. He calls for the appointment of an evil person to serve as the judge in this case. Someone who's familiar with matters of evil because they themselves deal in matters of evil. And alongside of this, he asks for an accuser. Uh, The word here is hashatan, the accuser, the word that's used for Satan, someone who tests things out. 
And if you're thinking right now that this doesn't sound like a very fair trial, then that's exactly the point, because the psalmist already knows what the verdict has to be, and he gives it in verse 7. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. The psalmist isn't interested in due process or reasonable doubt. If justice is going to be done, there can be no other verdict. And so he rushes ahead to the thing that he's really interested in from this trial, the sentencing. Verses 8 to 15. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May a creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off. Their names be blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. May their sins always remain before the Lord that he may blot out their name from the earth. Whew. So, you know, just a nice moderate sentencing. The psalmist's complaint here is rooted in the experience of injustice, and so his call for sentencing is a call for things to be set right, for justice to be done and justice to be visibly done. He calls for strict, merciless, exact retribution here. After all, as we read in verses 16 to 20, his enemy had never thought of doing a kindness, so let no one do kindness to him. He had hounded to death the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted, so he should become just as poor and needy and brokenhearted. He loved to curse, so those curses should come back on him, seeping into his bones, wrapping around him like a cloak, dragging him down into nothingness, revisiting his children. What's interesting here is that in this whole section, there's really only one verb that could be understood as a direct appeal to God. That first imperative back in verse 6, appoint someone evil. And even that isn't very specific. The psalmist really seems to lose himself for a moment here. This isn't quite your typical prayer. It's probably not what Jesus had in mind when he said to pray for those who hurt you. But as we're going to see in a minute, this raw, brutal, unfiltered song of hate and vengeance is somehow a faithful prayer, too. We can tell already that this psalm speaks to us in two very different voices. There is, on one hand, that prayer of faithful trust and thanksgiving, and there's also the expression of unrestrained rage, looking for justice. And I think if we're going to be honest this morning, we can recognize a little bit of ourselves in both. On the one hand, of course we come to God for help. Of course we know that his nose is longer, that his justice is better, that his sovereignty is certain. But also, sometimes we're angry. And there is that part of us that absolutely would like for our anger to have direct access to and impact on the person or people who hurt us without having to submit it first to the sovereign, faithful, compassionate rule of God. My nose is much too short, and sometimes I want that short-nosed justice. This psalm knows something that some of you listening today also know. It knows about the experience of exploitation and injustice. It knows about that deep, relentless anger, which won't be pushed aside and which leaves no room for anything else. And if this is your experience today to any degree, on any level, I'm so sorry, and I pray this psalm in solidarity with you. But know that the psalm doesn't end here. Like most of the Psalms, there comes a turning point, and it happens in this one, in verse 21. But you, sovereign Lord, help me for your namesake. Out of the goodness of your love, deliver me, for I am poor and needy. The psalmist takes his overwhelming anger and carries it in all of its fury, all of its bitterness, all of its ugliness, all of its vindictiveness, into the presence of God. He gives voice to all that he is feeling. He says out loud how bad the situation really is. Anger like this, injustice like this, demands articulation. It demands to be spoken because repressing it just won't do. When we swallow down our anger, when we never let ourselves speak it, 
when we never recognize how bad the problem really is, it doesn't just go away. It smolders and it festers and it waits and then it explodes all over our unsuspecting spouse or child or sibling or neighbor the next time they make a small mistake. Or maybe we don't repress it and instead we give ourselves free reign to exercise some of that short-nosed justice and we strike back in anger. And I don't know about you, but I've tried some of each and I know that they just don't work. Both are destructive, both are unhealthy, both are unhelpful, and both are unfaithful because they hold part of our lives and part of our hearts back from the sovereignty of God. So instead, the psalmist brings his anger to God and he says how bad it really is. But he doesn't only bring his anger, he submits his anger to God. He gives it over entirely. And this doesn't happen because the psalmist just suddenly learns to be okay with injustice or because justice suddenly becomes less worth pursuing. Quite the opposite of these things. This change can happen in the psalmist only and entirely because of who God is. Listen again to the way in which the psalmist brings his case to God. But you, sovereign Lord, help me for your namesake. Out of the goodness of your love, deliver me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. He appeals to God to intervene on three grounds. First, help me for your name's sake. Maintain your reputation. Aren't you the God who gave order to creation? Aren't you the God who reigns in justice and salvation? Aren't you the God who rules over all the nations? Aren't you the God who defends the marginalized? He appeals, first of all, to the kingship of God to the majesty of God, to the sovereignty of God, and asks for God to put all of these things on display to show what his reign really looks like because it's not what the psalmist is experiencing. Second, he says, help me out of the goodness of your love. The word love here is that same term, hesed, that Pastor Rob talked about in his sermon the last week. The covenant loyalty of God, the faithfulness of God, the commitment of God to his people. It's very often the thing that comes as the turning point in the psalmist's prayers when he is overwhelmed. This is the same God who delivered the Israelites from Egypt through a series of plagues who divided the sea in two so that they could pass across safely and sent the waves tumbling back into place, sweeping away the armies of the Pharaoh. This is the God who rises to David's defense with smoke pouring out of his nose in 2 Samuel 22. This is the God who vindicates and avenges his people. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord in Deuteronomy 32. This God takes seriously his commitment to justice and his commitment to his people, and he has proven himself to be trustworthy. And finally, the psalmist appeals to the compassion of God. Help me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. The psalmist is fading away like an evening shadow, shaken off like a locust. His knees are weak from fasting. His body is thin and gaunt. He's the object of scorn to his accusers. And from his absolute lowest state, he appeals to the God who is deeply grieved by the suffering of his people. This great, sovereign, just God is also a loving and personal God. He's not far off from the hurting. This is the God that the psalmist knows. And so he can give over his anger because God isn't weak or unmovable. God takes his reign seriously. He takes the well-being of his people seriously. And the psalmist can give voice to his anger and then surrender it to God because God is about the business of restoring justice. And notice a couple things about this. The surrender, the giving over of the psalmist's anger is a total, final, complete, irreversible surrender. There's no room here for half measures or for taking it back in the event that God doesn't act as swiftly as the psalmist would like or he doesn't deal out justice in the way that our short noses are hoping for. When God says vengeance is mine, he's also saying vengeance is not yours. Submitting our anger to God means we submit it to his justice, to his way, to his wisdom, his authority, his reign, and not ours. 
The psalmist brings his case to God and gives it to him, trusting God to act in a way that he sees fit. And in exchange, the psalmist is set free. So we come to the end of the psalm and find ourselves once again praying language that we feel comfortable speaking out loud. Verses 30 to 31. With my mouth, I greatly extol the Lord. In the great throng of worshipers, I will praise him, for he stands at the right hand of the needy to save their lives from those who would condemn them. When we come to God with our anger, he doesn't censor us or shut us down. He frees us. He releases us from our anger on the promise that he is sovereign, he is faithful, he is just, and he is compassionate. He is a worthy match for our deepest longings for justice. So by the end of the psalm, the psalmist is unburdened from the paralyzing weight of his anger, and he's free to live again, free to rejoice, free to praise, free to communicate the justice of God to a broken and hurting world in both word and in action. And maybe you're here today, and you haven't even had the words to express your anger and your disappointment to God. This is the psalm for you. It's an invitation for you to bring your very ugliest feelings to God and be freed by the one who is sovereign, faithful, just, and compassionate. Or maybe you're here today and you've never been this angry. You've never felt such a deep need for justice. If this doesn't seem like the psalm for you, I'd ask you to think, who is this psalm for? Who does it belong to? Who needs to pray this way today? Because when we pray the Psalms, we don't just pray them individually, we also pray them communally. We add our voices to the great choir of God's people in all places and in all ages who have offered up this anguished cry for justice. We pray it in solidarity with those all around us who are experiencing injustice today, adding our voices to theirs, pleading their case before God. We pray with them and for them through the process of articulating their deepest hurt and rage, trusting their case to the God who is faithful and just, and being set free. In praying the psalm, we learn to continually use our voices in all areas on behalf of those who need a vocal friend to join them in saying how bad it really is and in seeking justice instead. And then in praying this prayer, we are also set free to go on living as people of God, to shoulder the burdens of the burdened, to join God at the right hand of the needy, and to take up our place in that great crowd of worshipers giving praise to the God who is not turned away by or indifferent to our anger. Let's pray this morning. O oh God who we praise, thank you that you are not far off. It doesn't take much observation to see and to know that our world is very often unfair. And as we see and experience injustice, it is too much for our short noses to process or to endure. Thank you that when we find ourselves overwhelmed and burdened down with anger, you not only invite us to bring that to you in prayer, but you even give us the words to use when our anger leaves us wordless. Thank you that you meet us in those places and that you're not indifferent to our pain or to our experience, but you're deeply grieved by both and you take both seriously. So we ask that you would help us today to bring whatever we are facing to you, to say it out loud, to say just how bad it really is and then to trust it to you, knowing that you are faithful and good, absolutely just and sovereign, and that your nose is long. Help us, God, to then leave it with you. Release us to be people who live in such a way that we can contribute to your ongoing restoration of justice. We give praise to you this morning, Lord, adding our voices to the choir of your people who rejoice that you are the God who stands at the right hand of the needy. Help us to join you there, giving you glory in all that we do and all that we say. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.